Good morning. We're on another Wednesday morning, a beautiful, uh, snowy winter spring morning. It really actually was pretty. Diane and I were walking out this morning, uh, or she was rolling, I was walking, and um, it, it looked very, very pretty out with the snow on the trees and the ground and stuff. Uh, of course, the good other part of it is we know that it's very short-lived. We don't have months and months of it to look forward to at this point. Um, we are going to continue in Acts chapter 19, and I'm going to be reading uh, from verse 21 to verse 41, the end of the chapter. So there's a lot of information here. We're just, uh, we might take a couple Wednesdays to look through parts of it. Uh, I was reading this last night and thinking upon it, uh, and then a um, little bit more this morning uh, and meditating on uh, what I would share from a devotional perspective concerning it. So let me read the text. It's, uh, um, like I say, it's about 20 verses, so it'll take a few minutes here. <clears throat> now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I have been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. This would be in Ephesus. About that time there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, Men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see in here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is a danger, not only that this trade of ours come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be deposed from her magnificence. She whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him, and even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning with his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is a temple keeper of the great Artemis? and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash, for you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there's no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. So um, it's a fairly um, lengthy account. And uh, this morning, I would like to kind of focus in on three groups mentioned in this. And then next week, I think we'll come back and look at uh, the fourth group, that would be the disciples and Paul. But the first group is, of course, businessmen, the tradesmen who uh, are um, 
led by Demetrius, who is a silversmith. And if you remember, we finished last week with uh, the declaration that uh, up to 50,000 pieces of silver worth of uh, idolatry and stuff had been burned and destroyed. So it's, it's uh, not a surprise that in just right after that, we have a silversmith being upset. And so we have the silversmith and we have the uh, tradesmen who make their wealth and they are wealthy by making idols that are sold to people and different paraphernalia. I'm sure that go along with idolatry, uh, idolatrous worship. And so their wealth is being threatened, uh, not only in Ephesus, but throughout Asia because of the proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, that's the first group. We'll come back to them in a minute. Uh, the second group are the zealous believers uh, of the community, the uh, worshipers of Artemis uh, and uh, idolaters who have a sincere faith, a zealous faith, uh, but we're going to uh, look at, you know, how this group responds in this scenario. And third, we have the pragmatic city leaders uh, who, in the end, quiet everything down. So uh, backing up, um, this first group, these uh, wealthy people who make their money off of religion, it's, it's interesting that their, their God really is money. Their God is their wealth. And um, and in uh, applying this to our own hearts and stuff to challenge ourselves, we need to be careful not to uh, dismiss our potential for being like these people simply because we don't have a lot of wealth. We may be of a medium income or even of a lower income, but it doesn't mean that we don't have God as our money. If any of our personal uh, possessions and lifestyle, personal lifestyle, is threatened and we react with uh, anger and vengeance and uh, uh, defensiveness against this, um, we may be indicating that uh, our God is our money. Our God is that things that we possess. If we were to be depressed because we lost everything and become suicidal like many people did during the Great Depression, uh, that would clearly be an indication that money played too important a role. It doesn't mean that we don't take a proper care for and stewardship over what we own. But the anger and the plotting and uh, the, uh, the lengths to which we go to hold on to what is ours, <clears throat> even at the expense of others, uh, should clearly indicate to you and I that, you know, there's a case of idolatry, of worship of wealth. And these men do that. They say our, our business, our livelihood is in danger. And not only that, our goddess is in danger. So you, you could easily see they weren't really concerned about their goddess as much as it were the money they made off of their goddess. Um, as a pastor, there's always a danger of, uh, because my livelihood is made off of my proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ and teaching the Bible and ministering and serving, there's always a danger of uh, realizing that if I say something or teach something or don't go along with something, it's going to affect the growth of my church, which will affect my uh, future livelihood and my income. And so every pastor, every bishop, uh, all the way from uh, the top of uh, hierarchical structures to the pastor in, uh, in a small local church, will feel a pressure at times uh, concerning 
how they're ministering the gospel and, and how people are receiving it and the uh, outcome of that. And, and those are times that we need to evaluate our heart and say, what am I holding on to, my, my hope of the future or uh, my integrity in my ministry? I will confess I have had those challenges at time, and I've had to uh, ask myself that question, and I've had to answer it uh, in a way that enabled me to be faithful to what I believe to be the truth that I needed to proclaim. And in the end, it, I realized that, you know, whether I do this or something else, it's God that's going to be providing for me anyhow. I think we see some of that battle going on in our country now when we hear people talk about um, equity, uh, equity of education, equity of jobs, equity of finance. Um, there's, uh, for those that have, there's the initial reaction, of course, is, uh, you know, I've had to work hard for what I had. Uh, you just can't come in and take it away. This is communism, this is socialism. Uh, for those that don't have, uh, they're saying, well, we don't have the same abilities. We haven't generationally had the same abilities, and there needs to be uh, some fairness and equity in how things are run in this country. Um, and there's a lot of nuances to all these arguments. But what is our heart in that battle? If, if I am... Uh, willing to see somebody suffer so that I can have wealth, then uh, I am not worshiping the true God. I'm worshiping money. The battle of slavery in the Civil War and its ramifications even now today uh, I think are indicators often that those who claim to be God's people uh, are actually like these businessmen uh, that we see here in Paul's letter. Then we have this second group. These is, this is by and large the majority of believers. They're, they're sincere, zealous believers uh, in their gods. Uh, and uh, the thing about this group is their zealousness uh, and, and their faithfulness in their worship of the God that they, God, God or gods they serve, uh, opens them up to manipulation. Uh, rather than uh, hear a complaint like the businessmen are bringing forth and a threat to uh, the God that they worship and say, okay, now what really is going on here? Uh, is this really happening? Because for two years, Paul has been proclaiming the gospel throughout Asia and in Ephesus, and, uh, and this hasn't boiled over. There hasn't been this question about these men attacking uh, their gods, their goddess. Uh, but now when uh, the wealthy are seeing that their livelihood may be affected and they begin to stir people up, uh, everybody starts to be defensive for what they believe in rather than uh, saying confident, say, I believe this, but really what's going on here? Am I willing to uh, investigate? Am I willing to hear more? Am I willing to listen? Am I willing to talk with people who uh, are having a different opinion, a different perspective than I have, uh, without uh, this zealousness of uh, fighting for what I believe in? Um, and so when they're brought into uh, the theater and they're all around and, and the Jew gets up to give a defense, nobody even listens. They all start hollering. It kind of reminds you of some of the political rallies that you see on both sides of the issue, where rather than somebody being allowed to speak and, and walk something out through, they are shouted down, they're hollered out, they're threatened. Um, people on both sides of the issue are received death threats and insults and threats against their families. Um, 
all of that is very indicative of things we see in, in our political milieu of today. Uh, and here they were, uh, rather than um, let this man speak, they become enraged and holler, great is our minister of the Ephesians, great is our goddess. And they continue for a time. And then finally, we have this third group, the pragmatic uh, business, uh, government leaders, politicians. And uh, they bring a, uh, an order to what's going on. They don't do it because of justice or because of uh, any, I think, um, motive of trying to find out what's right or wrong, but they know that under Rome, a riotous act will be dealt with uh, very strongly and very violently. Rome had a thing called Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome, uh, and basically what it was is you either get along or we'll come in and cut your head off. I mean, that's pretty much how Rome uh, established peace throughout the known world of its time. And that peace brought many benefits to it. So commerce was able, you could travel from one point to another. You didn't have to worry about bandits. You didn't have to worry about every little group doing their own thing. If somebody got too out of hand, a legion of Roman soldiers would come in and resolve the issue really quick. Uh, so uh, the the government leaders, seeing what's going on, finally get to have a voice in it and say, you people need to quiet down, because if you don't, we're in trouble. If we are accused of a riot, we will pay for that. Uh, by uh, Roman uh, authority. And uh, so they are told there are courts, there are ways to handle complaints. Uh, and they make a statement that I think is is uh, something we're going to look at next week. And that is that these men who have been proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ are not defilers of temples and they are not blasphemers of the goddess Artemis or any other god. And that's the thing we're going to start with next Wednesday uh, about the gospel and about those who are proclaiming the good news. But I think you can read this story over and <clears throat> Look at it and see, <clears throat> excuse me, a little, that's a little harsh, I should have, uh, better not. Um, and um, ask the Holy Spirit to show you your own heart and where you and I might see ourselves in these three groups of people that we can actually repent of that and uh, and make up the fourth group. And those are those who love uh, their God and serve their Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll see you next Wednesday. Hope you have a good day.